Well, well, welcome to today's talk, Tuesday the 26th of October. Now, I want to talk about the speech, and indeed play the speech, by uh, Ms uh, Esther McVeigh, Member of Parliament for the uh, Fortunate People of uh, Tatton. And she really encapsulates a lot of what we've been thinking about and the frustrations that I know a lot of you are feeling. Now, this was in the English House of Commons. It was put forward by Sir Christopher Chope, a Conservative Member of Parliament. Now, this debate was attended by three Labour MPs, no Liberal Democrat MPs, no Scottish Nationalist MPs, and uh, eight or nine Conservative uh, MPs. Quite an abysmal turnout for such an important topic, which he talks about safe and effective. What do these words mean? And this is part of the problem. It, it, It is the corruption of the very language that we use to try and describe things that's used to change meaning. She talks about questions that really weren't allowed to be asked and talks about not the progress of science, but there's the science. You lot sit down there, take notes. I'll tell you what the science is. Don't think for yourself. And abusive terms like COVID, idiot, anti-vaxxers. And we really do need an open debate. But she puts it so well. But to just give her this, uh, I think it's about 10 minutes. Give her the time. And um, I know it alleviated a lot of the frustrations I've been feeling. So uh, over to Esther McVeigh. Thank you. And at the tail end of his speech, he talked about the phrase safe and effective. And I'd like to pick up on that phrase and start my speech from there. A phrase, safe and effective, that became the COVID vaccine catchphrase, we'll call it that, that was repeated so many times over the last couple of years, it cropped up everywhere in government communications, in interviews with experts, and across a media too, only too happy to run with that COVID slogan safe and effective. So ingrained did that become in the national psyche that to ever then ask questions about the COVID vaccine became very difficult to do indeed. And asking questions is a vital part of scientific and indeed political debate. However, when discussing COVID, we no longer appeared to be dealing with science Oh no, Mr Deputy Speaker, but rather the science. And to question the science was to risk being called and labelled a covid idiot, or that most poisonous of terms, anti-vaxxer. People who just wanted to query this new vaccine were closed down and were vilified. So I looked up the definition of anti-vaxxer and was surprised to learn that it is someone who opposes the use of some or all vaccines, regulations mandating vaccination, or usually both. And there were 246 of us in this House who, on the 13th of July 2021, voted against mandating the vaccines for care workers. That's 246 anti-vaxxers in this House, according to the latest definition. And that's absolute nonsense. People weren't anti-vaxxers. Other people have been now concerned that other vaccines families are losing faith in because of the way they were treated due to the COVID-19 vaccines. We've seen there has been a drop in the MMR vaccine. We've seen there has been a drop in the polio vaccine, which is wrong. People do need to take those vaccines. But all people in this house wanted to do was question this new vaccine, to have a debate on it, particularly when this House was wanting to mandate it on people and on care workers. So my point is this, if we allow language to be corrupted in this way and definitions of words to be bent out of shape, then we lack the tools for nuanced debate. And it is only by having a wide and open debate that we get to the central gravity of truth. I don't think we've had anything like a wide and open debate on the topic of the COVID-19 vaccines about their safety and their efficacy. And I come back to the word safe, free from harm or risk of any kind, a word with an absolute definition, not to be qualified or diminished. And yet we know that the COVID-19 vaccines, like all medical interventions, are not 100% free from risk or danger. And that's why the Blue Guide, a document published by the MR 
MHRA, which gives detailed guidance on the legislation controlling how medicines are advertised in the UK, says this. Advertising which states or implies that a product is safe is unacceptable. All medicines have the potential for side effects, and no medicine is completely risk-free, as individual patients respond differently to treatment. This principle is also replicated within the UK pharmaceutical industry's own self-regulatory code of practice, which also states the word safe must not be used without qualification. On that basis, and worryingly, both Pfizer and AstraZeneca are guilty by their own industry self-regulatory code of breaking their own best practice. They were found to have misled the public, both by misrepresenting and overstating the efficacy of the COVID vaccines and erroneously describing them as safe in press releases and on social media without qualification. How many other organisations and individuals are also guilty of misleading the public in this way? We were told that AstraZeneca vaccines was perfectly safe. That word again, and there was no evidence of blood clots. But the advice was changed on the 7th of April 2021 so that those under the age of 30 years old should be offered an alternative brand due to the now proven link with blood clots. And then the advice changed again so that under 40s should be offered an alternative brand. A safety signal was picked up and acted upon, thank goodness. But in Denmark, the problem was picked up much sooner. They paused the use of AstraZeneca on the 11th of March 2021 after they had vaccinated 734,000 people. At the same time, 24 million people had been vaccinated in the UK without the MHRA detecting a signal of a problem. Why were we so far behind the curve? Was it because debate had been closed down? Was it because people were not allowed to even question what was going on? And what about mRNA vaccines? In Florida last year, the state surgeon general recommended against males aged between 18 and 39 from receiving mRNA COVID-19 vaccines of any brand. My question is what evidence was Florida reacting to? And is the MHRA urgently looking into whether we should be following suit here? In July 2020, the government published the first Do No Harm report. It highlighted significant problems and stated that the MHRA needs substantial revision, particularly in relation to adverse event reporting and medical device regulation. It needs to ensure that it engages more with patients and their outcomes. The spontaneous reporting platform for medicines and devices, the Yellow Cards system, needs reform. The system is not good enough at spotting trends in practice and outcomes that give rise to safety concerns. What has been done since that report was published just over two years ago? Have these concerns been heard and acted upon? Dame June Rain, the head of the MHRA, recently said that the COVID pandemic has catalyzed the transformation of the regulator from watchdog to an enabler, which doesn't exactly sound like good news for anyone concerned about safety. Ultimately, it comes down to this. The government repeatedly told the public that COVID vaccines were safe. And for many, probably the vast majority, they were. But plenty of people have suffered as a result of their decision to follow the government advice and take this new medical intervention. Some have tragically lost their lives, and, as was noted last month at the COVID inquiry by Anna Morris KC, victims and their families have been marginalised and face stigma and abuse for sharing their symptoms and have been branded anti-vax for sharing very real and medically proven <coughs> vaccine injuries. This is really quite unacceptable. 
It is way past time that the government does the right thing and follows the recommendations of my honourable friend from Christchurch. It has been shocking to hear how slowly the vaccine damage payment scheme has been operating. Applicants have having to wait months. We heard too from the solicitor Peter Todd at a re recent hearing of our APPG on pandemic response and recovery. He described how 139 applications had been waiting or applicants have been waiting for more than 18 months for a decision on their case. This is excessively long, especially when people are injured and potentially unable to work. We were also told that 162 claims were found to have had disablement uh, caused by vaccine, but it was judged that they were just not disabled enough to merit a financial reward. And in many of those cases, the decision was reached without a doctor meeting or even speaking with the applicant to help with the assessment. And in the rare cases that there have been awarded money, well, that payment hasn't changed, as my honourable friend for Christchurch said, since 2007. So its value has been eroded by inflation, and it simply just isn't good enough. And so, in conclusion, I'll make a plea for transparency and integrity. It's time to be honest with the public about the safety of these vaccines, and we must start by giving them access to information and data without further delay. And we must also, as an urgent priority, look after those who have been damaged or those who have tragically lost loved ones. We may then begin to restore faith that has undoubtedly been lost in the authorities responsible for protecting and promoting public health. There are many unanswered questions and the repetition from ministers of those three words, safe and effective, for all the reasons I have just given, is simply not good enough an answer. And I'm delighted to be supporting my honourable friend uh, from Christchurch Bill today. Well, I just wanted to play that through because I know that uh, Esther McVeigh there really encapsulates a lot of the sentiments that we've been thinking about and um, really gives uh, words to our frustrations in, in that speech. Just before we finish today, I just want to read a, a short excerpt from the, um, this is from the appendix of a book called uh, 1984. It was expected that new speak would have finally superseded old speak or standard English, as we should call it, by about the year 2050. Now, this is actually quite concerning. Um, this is the sort of time frame that is quite feasible for the way things are going, foreseen by George Orwell in 1948, of course. Meanwhile, it gained ground steadily. That's new speak, gained ground steadily. All party members tending to use new speak words and grammatical constructions more and more in their everyday speech. Really is quite uncanny when you read some of these, uh, well, predictions uh, from uh, the late great George Orwell. So to George Orwell uh, and uh, Esther McVeigh, thank you very much and thank you for watching.